Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for, and, and the organizers for inviting me and setting up this great summer institute. Um, I'm also uh, very grateful to the, many of the previous speakers, in particular Patrick Haggard and Paul Chisek, for uh, getting some of the core concepts across and so allowing me to skip through the preliminary slides fairly quickly that, are, that should be non-controversial either um, because of their topic or because of what has been uh, previously said. For me, this, this Summer Institute um, has been extremely informative and instructive because I don't work on consciousness and I don't really have a very clear idea of what consciousness is. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, so what my personal understanding of consciousness is, and, and I, I know a lot of you disagree, um, but my personal, personal understanding of consciousness is that it, this is a, a, a cognitive, a higher cognitive faculty of the brain, a function of the brain, that in, in some aspects, without going into much detail, is sort of similar to language in a lot of ways. Um, it means that, for me, consciousness, much like language, is something only humans have, but that doesn't mean that we can't study certain components or, or precursors or cousins, if you want, um, in, in other animals. And cousins, I say, because, of course, I work in flies, and one might think that, well, flies are just like ancestors of humans, but of course they're not. Flies are highly evolved insects. And they're not much older than we are, in evolutionarily speaking, so they're very highly evolved, so they're much more like cousins. And I'll, I'll get a little bit into that, in, in what ways they're cousins, and in what way we can actually study things like language um, on a very basic level um, in flies. So let's, let's get on, and let's get some of the preliminary things. Uh, I already started with that, but let's get some of the preliminary things out of the way. Clearly, we've heard several people now talk about Cartesian dualism. 1647 is one of the key dates. Uh, the last time I heard anybody of note seriously propose dualism was uh, in this book by Karl Popper and John Eccles from 1977. But ever since then, uh, dualism has not really had any, any support of note whatsoever. So one could clearly say that dualism by now has been dead for, well, since, since I started school, roughly. Um, and basically since 1977, as Michael Graziano said, there's no non-physical magic. So I think I want to get this out of the way when we talk about things that, well, maybe used, used to have been called free will, or maybe we still want to call free will. That may be something uh, we can discuss uh, after the presentation. So basically mental states, I would say with Hans Floor, mental states are, of course, always brain states, which means physical states. Now, when we're talking about things like free will, and I'm, I have to emphasize, I'll try to do that several times during my talk, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a neurobiologist. Right? So I look at things from, and I have very little uh, philosophical knowledge or training. And so one of the things that always comes up is something that, in a lot of, that shares a couple of things with dualism, uh, and that's determinism, like the idea of Newton's clockwork universe, and that ceased to be an effective way of modeling the universe with the father of my PhD advisor, Werner Heisenberg, and his uncertainty principle, which entails that it by principle, and not just by technical means, we cannot predict the future. Already, Einstein didn't like that idea, and with his famous quote that God doesn't throw dice, and uh, said that, you know, if, this would work, if that were the case, you would have something like spooky action at a distance, and then experimentalists do the experiment, and they found actually there is spooky action at a, at a distance that's called quantum entanglement. It went on later with Bell's theorem and, and subsequent experiments that showed, or at least didn't find any evidence for local realism, so another suggestion by proponents of determinism and that also failed. Uh, Stephen Hawking is so confident that the um, uncertainty principle is actually a fundamental principle in the world that he um, proposed uh, that black holes should emit Hawking radiation and an analog of that has been observed in the lab. It hasn't been observed, it hasn't been measured directly but it, uh, uh, in, at black holes, but it has been, uh, an analog has been shown in the lab fairly recently. And uh, quantum coherence is something that um, pl plants use in photosynthesis. So even on the macroscopic scale, quantum mechanics is a reality of our lives, and you can say that uh, much as dualism, determinism doesn't have any empirical support. For the last 80 years, every single test for determinism has been failed. And if I can follow my, my physicist friends, then uh, 
determinism can be buried at least until there is an experiment that shows that or provides some evidence for determinism. And unlike, unless um, brains are a deterministic bubble in an interministic universe, brain in, brains are also part of this indeterminate quantum uh, world. That doesn't mean necessarily, and there's no evidence for that, that quantum effects have any effect on the brain as um, plants use quantum effects. It doesn't, have the, it doesn't mean that the brain has to use it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have any data on it. My hunch, my personal opinion or speculation, if you want, is that probably quantum effects play no major role in the brain, but they could. And what we do know is that they do occur in the brain. But whether or not they're, in, um, they're relevant or uh, important, we don't know. So basically, we can talk with Christoph Koch. If there is a deterministic component to, the, to reality, if there is something that we can predict that is or has the feeling of uh, a clockwork, it's not a Swiss-made clockwork. It's sloppy, and it contains noise. So the universe consists of stochastic and deterministic events. And so stochasticity and determinism are not mutual, mutually exclusive uh, entities. They're a language dichotomy. But of course, if you look at individual components of reality, then they can land on this grayscale that are either, either more deterministic or more stochastic. So clearly, it's not uh, a dichotomy when if you look at an entity in the world that it's either stochastic or it's deterministic, usually it's a mix and sometimes an interacting mix of those two components. And this is something um, that might seem abstract, but it's something that we've come to appreciate over the centuries, well, over the one and a half centuries, um, particularly in, in evolution, as Darwin has been pointing out, where we can observe uh, vari variability both between species and within species, and we can, conserve, can observe consistency, the, the faithful transmission of information, be that between different species, as the white and the black stork, or within species, as you can see in the similarity of this, this family depiction here. So also in evolution, we have this, this mix, and we've come to be very familiar with that, and it's very intuitive by now, this, this uh, interaction of variability and consistency, of mutation and selection, to use Darwin's words, or chance and necessity, to use the book title of uh, Jacques Monod. And we know this variability. We know how this variability in evolution is generated. There's a lot of different ways. It's not just random... Um, mutation generated by um, ultraviolet light or any other kind of mutagen, a chemical mutagen, prokaryotes exchange and vir viruses exchange DNA material in various ways, either via plasmids or whole genomes, via conjugation of large parts of the genome. Uh, viruses help in mitigating this. There's direct horizontal gene transfer via DNA uptake. We know that in prokaryotes, we know that in eukaryotes, there are transposable elements, so-called jumping genes, transposons. We know their structure. We know the function. We know how they work. We know, we have studied in very great detail how variability in evolution is being generated. And, of course, another source of variability is sexual reproduction, recombination um, in those um, organisms that, have, that, that use uh, sexual reproduction. And... We know the constancy. We know the, from population genetics, from quantitative genetics, we know the faithful transmission with very, in, in very precise detail. We can use mathematics to predict gene frequency changes given certain selection pressures, given certain mutation rates. We know the how variability and constancy, how they interact in evolution. There's another uh, example that I want to bring up very briefly of where this combination of stochastic and deterministic events produces something that each one alone would not be able to do, and that's chemotaxis in the bacterium E. coli. And so what you see here is a bacterium E. coli, and it uses these flagelli to propel itself in its environment, in its uh, liquid environment in most cases. And so they rotate in a certain direction, and they rotate such that the entire um, bundle of flagelli is rotating in the same direction and then acting in a way like a propeller of a boat and that propels the bacterium forward. And then whenever it, so and it does so as long as the uh, 
chemical sensors on its surface tell the bacterium that the conditions are either improving or are constant. And as soon as conditions start to decrease, what happens is that the synchrony in this rotation of the flagella, flagelli starts to change. It starts to be broken up, and it rotates the, in a tumbling movement, it rotates the bacterium into a random direction, and then it starts swimming again. So we have these brief pulses of variability, of stochastic movement, if you want, that reorients the bacterium, and then it keeps swimming again. And then what happens if you have here an attractant is that here it's moving away from the attractant, it starts to tumble, and then you have longer stretches that go towards the, um, uh, towards the attractant, and then they'll tumble, and then this, this doesn't bring me there. So on average, stochastically, on average you have longer movements towards the attractant and shorter movements away from it, which will eventually bring the bacterium closer to the attractant. And of course the opposite is the case if you have an, a repellent and you have a decreasing concentration of the repellent. So again here, what we have is we have the interaction of chance and necessity. So if both for this movement and for evolution, if you said, oh, this is all blind chance, you would be wrong because you're missing an important component. And also, conversely, if you'd say, oh, this is clear, I can totally predict how it's happening. No, it's also, you would also be wrong because you're missing the stochastic component. So isolating one over the other or emphasizing one over the other is missing the tight link between the two. Now, you might wonder, what does all this, why am I talking about bacteria and about evolution um, when the title uh, was to talk about free will? Um, and for that, we should look at um, what people before me have said what free will actually is. And so, uh, Taylor and Dennett in 2002 wrote, I could have done otherwise, as a description of, uh, or a very common description of what free will would entail. Uh, Cyril wrote in 1984, we could have often done otherwise than we in fact did. Much earlier than that, David Hume said, if we choose to remain at rest, we may, but if we choose to move, we also may. Now, this sounds to me, as a biologist, like decision making, right? So we choose whether we want to move or not, in Hume's terms, and so decision making is an involved brain function. So I can look at uh, I can look at brains and find out how do brains make decisions. Now, as you might have, or as you probably have, as you followed the uh, previous presentations, you've noticed that a very common idea of how brain solves problems is, oh, okay, sorry, I should have taken that out, is uh, that they respond to external stimuli, right? So, um, Paul Chisek showed William James saying that, well, it's all stimulus response. And we've seen the picture of uh, Donald Hebb's book where it's a stimulus and response and what occurs in the brain in the interval between them. If you go to a standard biology textbook that I just picked more or less at random from uh, the textbooks we have in our department, what you find is that this is how brain works. Brains work, you have sensory input, you have integration, and then you have motor output. In fact, all animals are supposed to react to external stimuli in a more or, way, more or less automated way. And insects, in particular, have been uh, depicted as the epitome of being you know, stimulus response machines. On top of that, if you go into uh, to study biology, if you do that, one of the first things that you learn, even at high school, at least in Germany, we learn at high school, you know, the simplest behavior, that's how you start with, you learn some neurophysiology, and then the simplest behavior uh, is the reflex. Now, and I'm going to try to make the case that, in fact, it may be the simplest, but one can, for A, one can debate that, and B, um, it may even be more likely that this is not necessarily the simplest, but it's the most reproducible behavior that we know so well, uh, or we know so much about this behavior and how it works, is because it's very reproducible and it's easy to study in the lab. And so, in, in order to show this, um, I've picked another example out of... Um, uh, the, the biology, behavioral biology um, repertoire, and that's an escape response by fish that we also know very well because it's highly reproducible and it involves the largest neuron in vertebrates, the Mautner cell. The behavior goes as follows. You have this fish and then there's some uh, disturbance in the water from this side that's being picked up either by the inner ear or by the uh, lateral line organ, which leads to the animal forming this C. That's why it's called a C-start response and which uh, brings the 
uh, direction, the ax body axis of the animal away from the stimulus so that it can eventually escape. And this is being done here by, for instance, by the ear. Then this huge neuron here is the, the Mautner cell, and that then uh, activates very quickly the trunk muscles on this side leading to the, um, to the C-start response. Now, if all our behaviors were stimulus response behaviors such as uh, this escape response in fish, uh, I would like to see what would happen to us. There you go. Well, that's a tentacled snake, and its prey obviously is fish. Its prey are fish. And so you might wonder, how does the snake catch the fish? And so what you see is here, it's moving here first to elicit the sea start response and then predict where the animal is going, where the fish will be going. So clearly, if, I'm, if all the behaviors are as predictable as this response, then clearly evolution has plenty of time to evolve either a predator or a prey that will predict where I'm going, and then if I'm a predator, escape me, or if I'm a prey, catch me and eat me. So clearly, if all our behaviors would be stimulus response, we would be organized according to stimulus response, we wouldn't be able to survive for very long. So what people have done in, in laboratory experiments is basically test animals and humans in equivalence of these situations and ask, what would you do? What is your choice? And then you can imagine, in most cases, there isn't a lot of choice involved. Or if you take this, it's also fairly clear if a human is put into the situation, even though one might argue or not that in principle, as Hume said, that person might choose to remain addressed, most would not. And it's rarer to see in the laboratory that these kind of choice situations, although this is starting now, thankfully enough, people are studying these kind of situations, or to be fair, um, this sort of situation. And as we've learned yesterday, people are realizing that in the, the wild is nothing like a laboratory experiment. And so clearly, an important issue concerning whether or not, or an important issue about how we decide and what kind, is, is what kind of options do we have. And so, to quote Ludwig Wittgenstein, the freedom of the will consists in the impossibility of knowing actions that still lie in the future. And so if I want to study this, I need to make sure that the environment is on, isn't already telling me what's going to happen. If I want to find out if there is anything such as unpredictability, if there is something as freedom, um, depending on how you would want to define freedom, but if there is anything like that that is not deterministic, then at least I have to take the deterministic components that I know out of the environment. Otherwise, it becomes very tricky to study these sorts of things if I'm experimentally um, causing them to go away. So if you want to study choice behavior, you want to make it ambiguous because otherwise you might just be studying uh, laboratory artifacts or um, laboratory special conditions that are not uh, the conditions under which the brain evolved. And so how are we doing this? We're doing this in flies. And we know in flies fairly well which are the stimuli that make the flies go in one or the other direction. So we know this very well and we're taking these stimuli away. So this entails that we need to have a very, very good, um, a very good knowledge of and a very good control over the stimuli that reaches the fly. And for that, we need to fix it in space. And so what you can see here is a drop of glue between the head and thorax of the fly and then a little hook. The fly can fly around with that hook, but so we prevent it from doing that by keeping them in little containers. And so for the experiment, we have a clamp up here that you can barely see here, a clamp that holds that uh, hook in place so the fly can't fly anywhere and it can't move anywhere and it can't rotate, it can't roll. This is the situation in which the fly is for the entire duration of the experiment. What you can see is that it can still do a lot of things, but it can't translate or rotate. Uh, it can move its antennae, as you see, and it does. Beat its wings and its haltiers, which are difficult to see. Move its legs, its abdomen. Uh, and probably, which you can't see in this, in principle, it can also move its proboscis. So there's a lot of behavior that the animal in principle can do. However, the only thing that we look at is the rotational force that it exerts when it attempts to turn left or to turn right. So it's not turning, ever. It just attempts to turn. So if I say when the fly turns to the left, when the fly turns to the right, what I'm actually trying to say is, is a shorthand for it attempts to turn left and it attempts to turn right. 
And what we measure here, what you've seen, the data that you've seen come up here in, in uh, fast forward uh, in time lapse, is a 30 minute interval of measuring the right turning attempts and the left turning attempts in a situation where there's a constant stimulus situation. So there's, there's no stimulus in the environment of the animal that tells the animal where to go. And as I said, uh, people have been studying this, this behavior for over 50 years now, since the, since the early 60s. Uh, this machine that I use is actually from 1963. That's one when it was built. Um, so we know very well which, which stimuli in the environment cause the animal or make the animal more likely to turn in one or the other direction. And we take all of those away. And still, the animal goes to the right, it goes to the left, it goes to the right. So it varies this in the absence of any stimulus that says now left, now right, now left, now right. So clearly those are actions, not responses. There's no stimulus there that would trigger a response. Those are actions that, um, for lack of a better word, are spontaneous and that uh, come from the animal and are not triggered by the environment. Now you could say, well, so if you buy my argument that uh, there are no stimuli triggering these behaviors, you could still say, well, you know, the brain is an input-output organ, and you just switched off the input. Like, a, like any good radio, you just get noise outside uh, on the output end, and uh, that's the variability that you see. And this, is, I think, is a valid hypothesis, and we set out to test that a couple of years ago by um, looking and do it, doing a quantitative analysis of the fly behavioral traits that you just saw. So in order to explain to you um, how we did this, in order to explain how we did this, let's zoom in on five minutes of this 30-minute uh, interval. And what you see is that you have a baseline fluctuation, superimposed of which are those spikes. Those correspond in free flight to body saccades. So the fly, and you, if you watch a fly, uh, one of those fruit flies hovering over, over the banana, um, then what you find is that they don't fly smooth curves like airplanes. They zigzag around, and they do this roughly for the same purpose as we move our eyes with saccades. It's motion vision is suppressed during those saccades. And so we can see these free flight saccades corresponding to torque spikes um, in our data that we measure. And then we can use those torque spikes, and for the moment, we'll, well, we did an analysis, but I'm not going to go into that now, but for the moment, we disregard whether those go to the right or to the left, and simply look at the sequence of these behaviors. Right? So those are fixed action patterns in a way that the animal initiates on, it, on its own. And if that is random noise, this should conform to a Poisson model of random number generators, if you want. So that's the easiest, uh, most simple and straightforward random number generator or random event generator is a Poisson model that we can generate in the, in the computer that uh, prevent, uh, provides us with uh, individual events. And then we used uh, a battery of mathematical tools, the first one that we used was one that quantifies the ability of random number generators to actually generate random numbers. So computers never, never fully, never, never generate random numbers to 100%, so to, that are perfectly random. There's always, that, the way they are generated prevents them um, from being perfectly random. And so because the algorithms to generate random, number gener random numbers vary there's a method that's called the GRIP procedure, the geometric random inner products, that quantifies how close to random, to pure random, how close to that is this random number generator. And we use that, that was developed for computer science, we use that to compare our own random number generator, which is fairly close to random. So zero, so I said it's a deviation from random, zero is perfect random, and our process in the computer is fairly close to random. We can still, as, as expected, we can still dis distinguish it from perfect randomness, but it's um, fairly close, and flies are not even that close. So flies are hard to predict. Definitely, you can't predict the next turn of the fly uh, just by looking at it as, as without any uh, technical uh, help, but they're definitely not as good random number generators as our computers are. So definitely, it's not a simple uh, noise producer. That, that fly brain. Of course, you might say then, of, clearly, there's uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, 200,000, maybe uh, 100,000 uh, neurons in the fly brain. And so, of course, I mean, there's many noise sources in the fly brain. So we hooked two of those together in a so-called Cox process, either without a filter or here uh, with a filter. Of course, 
you might still say, well, that's only two. So we hooked up three and you know, eventually n. I don't recall how high the number n was. Um, but what we found was that we got progressively closer, and we use different methods of testing, not just the grid procedure. So we use different progressively complicated uh, mathematical uh, analysis methods to compare the computer-generated data with the fly data. And what we found was that it was we got better and better and closer and closer to flies, but what we eventually turned out, to cut a long story short, is that the important part was actually what those filters looked like and not how many random processes we had. So how those random processes were connected to each other was a lot more important to making the data close to fly behavior than the, how many random processes we had. And the important aspect of it was the more nonlinear we made this, the more similar our data became to fly data. And so we started using, uh, and that was that's a final, uh, the final concept that, that I'm trying to explain in this, this set of experiments. Um, we used an, a method from, that ecologists have used to look at food webs, in, at marine food webs, to detect a nonlinear signature in the fly. So we had this idea that maybe nonlinearity had something to do with the temporal structure of the fly behavior. And this method gave us a tool to detect, to actually positively detect a nonlinear signature in the fly behavior. And how does that method work? So in principle, it works like a, a weather forecast. So you take half of the fly data, the first 15 minutes, you derive a computer model, and that computer model we can tune so that it is either linear or in increasingly steps nonlinear. And then we compare the, the prediction of this computer model for the second half, for the second 15 minutes, we compare that with the actual data. So we see how we test how good is our prediction, how good is this model at predicting the data. And what you would uh, find then if you tune the nonlinearity is that if there's something, if it's a linear system that's producing uh, seemingly stochastic beha um, uh, data, then this should be flat. If we increase nonlinearity of the model, this should not increase the ability of the model to predict, uh, to predict the, uh, the data. Whereas you should find an increase if there is a nonlinear signature in the fly behavior. And that's exactly what we find. So this is, again, just an example of this. Um, of the fly data. In this case, we had 13 flies there for, with half an hour uninterrupted flight. And what we find is this increase, as, as we increase the weighting parameter uh, that signifies the nonlinearity of the model, we increase the fit of the uh, model data with the actual data. Now, we've adapted a, an agent, a software agent, from the literature that we found that's on, that consists of three nonlinear oscillators. The there's an activator here that activates a right turn oscillator and a left turn oscillator that are mutually inhibiting each other. And so I won't have time to go into the, the mathematical details. I'll show a brief um, function as to how this was uh, generated. But we take the left and right turn oscillators, subtract them from each other to generate something that looks fairly similar um, or that corresponds, let me put it this way, that can look similar, corresponds to the fly torque output in terms of left and right. And what we find, not surprisingly, since those are nonlinear uh, uh, functions that drive this uh, agent, we find this uh, steep increase in the, in the so-called SMAP procedure, in this, this for, nonlinear forecasting method. And, of course, if we, uh, if we can tune it differently to make, the not li to make a, a nonlinear system produce linear output, then it uh, becomes flat. So our method is working, and, and, and uh, this mathematical model, shows, mathematical model shows that if flies had been linear, we would have, been detect would have detected it. We can also tune this um, software agent to look very similar to flies, to do this sort of, now I'm turning in this direction, and then I switch turning in the other direction. However, and we haven't had the, the, the time and resources to fully explore this yet, so we don't quite know why this is. Um, then if we make the agent look like a fly, we have to tune it such that it is um, linear, that its output is linear, and if we make it, if we tune it such that its output is nonlinear, it doesn't look like a fly at all. So one of the ideas that, that we've had, and, and again, we haven't explored this, this is still something that, that I would like to do. Um, one of the possibilities of why we find this weird dissociation is that flies may be able to behave both linearly if, linearly if they have to, so it's in a stimulus response way if you want, and non-linearly. So they may be able to 
uh, alternate between linear and nonlinear functioning of the brain. And the, the reason I, um, I say that is that so this is a function, this is a logistic map. This is a very well-known uh, recursive function. And so you have the state of the previous iteration uh, determines with a, with a factor here, lambda determines the state of the current inter iteration. And um, the state lambda here determines what kind of convergence behavior we'll find or divergence behavior we'll find of the function. So if you take this lambda, you have you know, about 1,000 to 10,000 iterations of this function at, at different S starting states, and this is the final state after about 10,000 uh, iterations. And then you modify lambda. What you find is that it converges until a certain lambda. Then it starts to diverge. You get two different values. And then you get this bifurcation or bi Feigenbaum scenario. It's a bifurcation, bifurcation scenario. Until at the end, you can't tell if, if the beginning S values were very close. They might be... Uh, they might be very different from each other at the end. And so the linear, if we have, if we tune lambda to be within this range, then we get the linear output. If we tune lambda to be out here in the chaotic or nonlinear or unstable, mathematically unstable state, then this agent becomes nonlinear. So clearly our method distinguishes between systems that are this, like this, or that are like that. And uh, a, a possibility of how flies manage to be nonlinear but still look like flies and not like the software agent, and it's a little bit hand waving, I admit that, but we just simply don't know, is that if they can switch between the linear and the nonlinear mode, if they're at criticality, if you, would, if, if you want, that they're at this point where they're almost nonlinear but not quite, and where they're almost, not, almost linear and not quite. So where they're balancing the stochastic and the deterministic components. This is what it looks like. So, and these systems uh, are very well known for being random-like by being hard to predict, but also deterministic in the way that they combine uh, or, or use noise and, and stochastic processes to be able to amplify them, for instance, and to, to generate variability. So these kinds of systems that we can detect in, or, or where we have evidence that they might be um, operating in, a fly, in the fly brain, these kind of systems are in this gray area between chance, between chance and necessity that incorporate both chance and necessity. And so this links the, uh, the, the, the story that I had in the beginning with the bacteria and the evolution, this links this up to the behavioral experiments that we have. Now, if we have, if this really uh, is a function of brains, then why should they have it? And I think I've made a fairly a uh, straightforward case that if we wouldn't have it, we wouldn't be here because we would have been eaten by now or starved to death. Clearly, the same logic applies for intraspecific uh, competition. If I can predict the next move of my opponent, I will have an advantage uh, opposed, uh, against everybody else who cannot do that. And I've heard that in certain mating systems even, uh, that uh, being borable, boring and predictable should lead to a detrimental mate choice, uh, I've been told. Um, the, another point evolutionarily that's um, where, where spontaneous behavioral variability is important is exploration. If you only follow the same rules that everybody else is following, you're never going to find that resource that nobody else is finding. So clearly in exploration, and this is where a large part of the math comes from that I've used here, um, clearly in exploration, um, uh, this is an, an, important, an important aspect where this kind of behavior is required. And then finally, and this is where the, the, the remaining couple of minutes of my talk are going to be about, is about what, uh, um, what we've, we've heard before in Patrick Haggard's talk about the detection of reafferent, and that's what, what Patrick called re retrospective signals, reafferent signals in the sensory screen, stream. It's like, how do I find out which portion of this humongous information, humongous stream of information that comes at me, which of that stream is actually under my control, which is... Uh, how can I distinguish from self-generated from non-self-generated stimuli? This is also what, what Patrick referred to as, as the feeling of agency or the generation of agency, that I can have these broad classes of, okay, this is mine and this is not mine in terms of, uh, of stimulus input. And this is what I'm going to spend the rest of the, of the talk on. So basically, I'm going to try to make the case, and, and I think we already have the, the, the necessary prerequisites for that, that brains are far from being stimulus response machines. They're actually uh, action outcome evaluation machines. So they, they use prospective actions uh, and then evaluate retrospective outcome, uh, outcomes. 
Uh, or you could say they're output-input machines. They're definitely not input-output machines. And so we already know what are the actions, right? This is the kind of data that I just showed. What are the actions and what are the outcomes? What kind of outcomes do we provide to the, to the animals? And so one of the experiments that we're using, and I should say that, um, uh, well, I, I mentioned that it was done in the 60s, the experiment that I showed before without any feedback, without any outcomes, um, was an experiment that was devised by my thesis advisor, Martin Heisenberg, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And so now, um, and this is an experiment that uh, they've built on top of that um, before in the 19, it was published in 1991, um, that uh, I then used in, in my graduate thesis and later um, to study the, uh, this how brains, how fly brains uh, compute this uh, outcome evaluation. And so the flies, as you've seen, are turning left and right. And now we use a, an infrared laser diode that provides a laser beam that the flies can't see. They're infrared. Um, and they're not even red sensitive. And, but they feel the heat, and they find this unpleasant. And so we tell the computer, whenever the fly attempts to turn to the right, switch the heat off. Whenever the fly attempts to turn to the left, switch the heat on. So if, imagine you're in the situation of the fly. There's nothing in your environment. You're, you're still behaving. You're able to do all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, it gets hot. And so you have to figure out, OK, what do I have to do to switch off the heat? And the flies can do this. It takes them about, uh, and this may be interesting in the discussion section. I can't go into that. Um, the fly, it takes them about. A few, from a few seconds to about a minute and a half to figure out how to switch the heat off. And then all the flies are, can reliably switch the heat off. They still try every now and then, is it still on? But uh, on the whole, they can switch it off. And if they wouldn't, uh, eventually it would kill them. It would kill them. So they can switch it on and off by themselves. Um, and this clearly is uh, what you would call an instrumental or operant contingency because the behavior controls the heat. And after about eight minutes of training, um, if we then switch the heat off permanently and ask, OK, do you prefer left turns or right turns, then they prefer the unpunished direction, wherever they've not been punished. So there's a fast component where they very quickly detect this is how I need to switch it off, and the slow component that takes about eight minutes. We can make it easier by telling the flies, OK, this is left and this is right. By whenever the fly turns to the left, we switch the heat on, and the light that's coming to the fly, we make it green. And whenever it turns to the right, we switch the heat off, and by this color filter, we make the environment blue. And so now it has, OK, left is green, right is blue. And they can do this after about four minutes of training. And they also figure it out how to handle all this much more easily. Because there's, there, I mean, it's fairly easy. You can anthropomorphize yourself why, the fly, why it's easier for the flies um, to solve this task. And um, clearly, this whole thing is still an operant ex experiment, but the colors predict the heat in a classical contingency. Much like the bell predicts the food, the colors predict the heat. And so how the experiment is done doesn't tell you what the animal is learning. And so you can't use operant and classical. So what we use here is what the animal is learning is learns about itself when it relates its behavior to the heat. And it learns about the world when it relates the colors to the heat. Right? So we're not changing the nomenclature of operant and classical conditioning here. Um, we're saying how something is done doesn't tell us what the brain is actually learning. And this is what we're studying. And this is what flies are good for. You can use genetic manipulations to find out what are the required components. And one of the components for learning, since this is a learning experiment, is the rutabaga enolate cyclase that generates CAMP. I just took this from a, from a standard uh, comparative psychology textbook. Makes PKA, makes a transcription factor, and you get long-term memory. It's a canonical, you know, part of a canonical pathway for synaptic plasticity. Part of why this is in textbooks is because you find it in virtually every animal uh, people have studied in terms of learning and memory. And so we take the rutabaga mutation and we test for two minutes. This is what we show here. There's a rutabaga mutation. We test them in this experiment. For, and what is shown here, the two minutes after, this, after eight minutes of training, for two minutes we ask them, do you, want the, uh, do you prefer the, um, the unpunished or the punished situation? If it's plus one, if this performance index is plus one, then for two minutes they prefer the unpunished one. If it's minus one, then they prefer the punished situation. And if it's zero, they had no preference. And what we find, not surprisingly, the learning mutation uh, doesn't show the preference and the wild type controls do. And if we manipulate protein kinase C by expressing inhibitory peptide under heat shock control, we don't see an effect. They learn this just fine. Now, this could be simply because 
this Rutabaga mutation in this adenylate cyclase was discovered as a classical conditioning gene. And this is a classical situation, a world learning situation. So we take this away. And what we find, lo and behold, Rutabaga mutants learn this just fine. They have no problems learning that. Uh, even a little bit better than wild type here. Whereas if we inhibit PKC, which had no effect on this type of learning, if we inhibit PKC, they are unable to uh, choose the unpunished situation uh, after training, while the wild type uh, animals where, the, where this uh, uh, PKC inhibitor was not expressed um, uh, was, was uh, where that, that, where this was not, not expressed, they did not have that effect. Now, and to wrap this up very quickly, we find the same. Um, we find the same sort of reliance on PKC, but not this analyte cyclase in aplasia. There we know the physiological mechanism. Uh, we don't know the physiological mechanism in mice, but they find a similar thing. Um, we know that the man manipulation, the PKC manipulation that they use, which was virtually identical to ours, disrupts cellular LTD, but it may also disrupt other things, and so we don't know that. So basically, we have uh, uh, these, these situations that contain a, contain a world learning component uh, that is Rutabaga dependent and a self learning component that's PKC dependent. And this, at least for now, we have the PKC evidence for the same sort of model systems that we have for the standard uh, synaptic plasticity. And the final point I wanted to mention is um, we don't. Of course, we want to know more about the molecular prerequisites for this type of learning, for this specialized self-learning. And another, that Skinner already recognized that um, verbal behavior, that learning language, language acquisition, is also a sort of an unoperant feedback loop. And uh, one gene that is uh, very prominently involved in humans fairly, very specifically in language is the FOXP2 gene. And so we looked if uh, the flies have a FOXP gene, and indeed they have. So vertebrates have quadrupled uh, much of their genome as opposed to invertebrates. So we only have one FOXP gene. The FOXP2 gene is involved very specifically in language. If you manipulate FOXP2 in songbirds, they have trouble learning their song. And if you manipulate it in mice, um, they have trouble in other in vocalizations, but also in other motor behaviors. And so we test the FOXP mutations that we have in this uh, self-learning paradigm, and what we find is a phenocopy of the PKC manipulations. So they learn the mutants shown here, they learn just fine in this situation, but in the self-learning situation, they still show a strong impairment. I don't have time to go into it, this is just simply a different way, not a mutant. It's an RNAi construct that shows exactly the same thing, making us very confident that it's really this FOXP gene in flies that has the analogous function uh, as it appears to be having in language acquisition in humans. And so finally, we have now spontaneous behavior in the fly that is one of its function is to do self-learning. And that self-learning mechanism appears to be conserved all across uh, those models where we have looked at. Those are some other components that we have right now. It's uh, very sketchy, very much at the beginning. Only a few people are working on this. And uh, what I didn't go into is that we have those two different learning components actually interact, and we're starting to get some biological handles on um, what those interactions um, what those interactions mean. And I won't go into what that actually means about free will. We can do that in the discussion. I think uh, some of the connotations and implications uh, should have become clear, and that's why I want to thank you very much and the flies for helping us find out how this works.